بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Salah is a very very focal and important integral part of our deen It is at the core of our experience as Muslims that we connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by means of our salah we are able to fulfill our needs and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever we might need or whatever might be troubling us by means of the prayer, by means of the salah. The salah is literally a direct channel and a direct access line for us to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah in the Quran, He says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِيمَانَكُمْ Allah literally substitutes the word salah with the word iman. So as to teach us, to remind us, to emphasize to us that the core of our iman and the survival of our iman, the protection of our faith and the continuity of our progress in terms of our own spirituality lies within salah and our preservation of the salah and our commitment to the salah. So salah is at the core of being a believer. It's an absolute fundamental value that a believer must embody, that a believer must live by. In the same token, salah is, as the Prophet ﷺ, it's observed about him, Whenever anything concerned the Prophet ﷺ, he at once would hasten towards the prayer. He would immediately turn towards the prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ, through his own personal example, he teaches us salah is the outlet by means of, by means of which we can fulfill our needs, we can solve our problems even. And we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, find the fruits of our iman, begin to taste the sweetness of having a connection and a direct relationship with Allah. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention quickly here in the introduction is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also teaches us a very, very basic core uh, elementary fundamental aspect of appreciating the salah and understanding the importance of it to our deen. And that is in a hadith Qudsi in which the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah has said that when we stand for the salah, when we stand for the salah and we recite Surah Al-Fatiha within our salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly responds to us in our prayer. Famous hadith Qudsi, Qasamtu salata bayni wa bayna abdi nisfain. As the slave, the hadith tells us, as the slave continues to go on reciting ayah after ayah after ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to him. And so literally, we always thought this was a metaphor, this is figurative, that when you perform salah, it's as if you were speaking to Allah, you are dialoguing with Allah, you are connecting with Allah. But that is the reality of the prayer and the reality of salah. Now having said that, one thing that concerns all of us, all Muslims, all believers, is there's one thing that is troubling to all of us, and that is the quality of our salah. How do we find quality within our prayer? How do I experience what I'm talking about? How does it go from talk, from theory, into a practical realization? How do I start to realize this power, this beauty, this transformative power of salah? And that is the word khushu. Concentration, focus, humility, submissiveness within the prayer. But I like to just refer to it as quality within our prayer. How do we get that? So the quickest, most efficient, productive, and practical way to achieve khushur within our salah, to find quality in our prayer, is to start to understand the meaning of the words that we read and recite within the salah, but not just their meaning, but their beauty the eloquence, the power, and, and just the sheer magnificence of these words that we recite within the prayer. And salah is a very beautiful combination of the two elements of our deen. The words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we recite the Qur'an within our salah, so it is of course the beauty and the majesty of Allah's word himself. And salah also contains the prophetic supplications, the prophetic adhkar, remembrance of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ with all of his eloquence and his conciseness and beauty and speech, that is also included within the prayer. So salah is a beautiful combination of the words of Allah that we recite in salah as an offering to Allah and also the prophetic supplications by means of which we seek forgiveness and we seek the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having said all of this, 
one of the parts of salah that is very powerful and very beautiful, and it's a very strategic point within the salah, is the tashahud, the sitting portion of prayer. The sitting po portion of prayer in and of itself is a very strategic thing. It is the culminating point, the climax and the high point of the salah. Because if you look at it when you start your salah from takbir, opening supplications in which you either ask for forgiveness or you state your commitment and devotion to Allah, you praise and you glorify Allah, you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you recite another portion of the Qur'an, you go into ruku' and you attribute greatness and firmness and stability to Allah, you stand up from the ruku' and you praise Him and you glorify Him, you go into your sujood and lower yourself to the lowest point possible by pay putting your face on the ground. And while you are at your lowest point possible, you say Allah is the highest, the most exalted. After doing all of this comes the sitting portion of the prayer. So it's like a climax of the salah. And so the words that we have been given to recite there by the Prophet ﷺ are equally as powerful and beautiful. So inshallah we'll be studying the language of specifically the tashahud, the very first thing we recite whenever we sit down in the sitting portion of the prayer. Now, in the court, I, I teach a one weekend seminar from Bayana titled Meaningful Prayer, Vocabulary of Salah. This seminar studies from beginning till end the eloquence, the beauty, the meaning of the words within Salah, trying to achieve this quality within our prayer. And the tashahud personally for me has always been one of the highlights of the course. And every single time I teach it, for me personally, once again, it's a highlight of the entire weekend. And the feedback that I've gotten from students is the same exact thing. One brother even told me recently, just a couple of days ago, that the, the part of the course that ended up transforming his prayer the most was the tashahud. And so when I decided, when I wanted to share something uh, with the community and also have it distributed, inshallah, as much as possible online, I decided that the tashahud would be, would be the ideal thing to inshallah share with everybody. And, and it's also something that we have little to no appreciation of. When, when was the last time you read a book or read an article or heard a lecture about the beauty of the words of the tashahud? Brave, barely ever. Most of the time our, our involvement when talking about salah is in regards to fiqh. But very little attention is paid to just the sheer beauty and the power and the meaning and the eloquence of these words. So inshallah that's why we decided to, uh, that's why I decided to share the tashahud portion of the prayer. Now, one thing that's interesting about the tashahud portion of the prayer, there are five different narrations coming from the Prophet ﷺ. So basically, there are five variations of the tashahud, narrated by five different companions of the Prophet ﷺ, directly from him. And so each tashahud is named after the companion who learned it and narrated it from the Prophet ﷺ. And alhamdulillah, in the Meaningful Prayer course, we teach all five variations of the tashahud. However, today... Inshallah, I'll be sharing two, and if time permits, maybe a third one, inshallah. But we'll be talking about at least two of them. The first one we're going to study is the tashahud narrated by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And it has a very beautiful story, a very beautiful narration to it as well, where Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says that the Prophet sallallahu taught me the tashahud, and my hand was in between his two hands. وَكَفِّي بَيْنَ كَفَّيْهِ so lovingly, he sat down with me, he took my hand in his hand, and he sat there and he taught me the tashahud in a very loving manner. And then he goes on to say that he taught this same tashahud in the same manner to his, one of his best students, Alqama, rahimahullah, in the same way. He says, I took his hand in between my hands and I taught him the tashahud. Alqama says, I learned the tashahud when my hand was in between the hands of Ibn Mas'ud. And then Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah, he says, I learned the tashahud and my hand was in between the hands of Alqama. And then Hamad ibn Salima, rahimahullah, he says, I learned the tashahud and my hand was in between the two hands of Ibrahim al nakhai rahimahullah, my teacher. And then Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he says that I learned the tashahud and my hand was in between the two hands of my teacher Hamad ibn Salima, rahimahullah. And in this beautiful manner, not just the words, but the habit and the mannerisms of the Prophet sallallahu have carried on throughout the traditions and the scholars have maintained this consistency. Subhanallah. So we'll first study the tashahud of Ibn Mas'ud in full detail. 
And then we'll take a look at maybe one or maybe two more tashahuds and we'll see what is the variation, what is the difference and highlight the eloquence and the beauty of that difference and how each tashahud is equally as powerful and equally as beautiful. So the very first one is the tashahud of Ibn Mas'ud. At-tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. As-salamu alayka ayyuhant nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. So to begin with the word analysis, the word analysis, because each word needs to be appreciated in and of itself. The first word is التحيات. The very interesting word. This is a plural word of the word تحية. تحية means greeting. It means greeting, like to greet someone. At-tahiyyat is the plural of that word, greetings. And the word greeting in and of itself tells the story of the origins of this word, the etymology of this word. The word tahiyya comes from the root of the word hayat, which means life. So why does the word for greeting come from the word which means life? Well, because pre-Islamically, in the times of Jahiliyyah, the Arabs, when they would greet one another, they would greet each other by saying a supplication. They would say, Hayak Allah. Hayakum Allah. May, may Allah give you a long and prosperous life. And this was the way they would greet each other. It's a good supplication, nothing wrong with it. But like when somebody would walk through the door, this is what they would say. They'd say, Hayak Allah. And this is how they would greet each other. So because they would make dua for the life of the person, the word for greeting also became extracted from the root word of life, tahiyya, which means to greet, pray for somebody's life. Later on when Islam came and the teachings of Islam came, then of course, the Qur'an and the Prophet ﷺ taught us a different, supplica- a, a different greeting, and that is the greeting of As-Salamu Alaikum. That's the greeting of Islam. So even though the greeting changed, and our greeting today is As-Salamu Alaikum, the word for greeting, the title for greeting remained the same. Tahiyya still means to greet. And that's why the Qur'an even uses that term, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أُرُدُّهَا When somebody greets you with a greeting, then return that greeting back to them better, or at least make sure that you return the equal greeting. Which by the way is a lesson that when people say salam to us, Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Somebody says a nice, a nice salam. So salam should not be returned that way. You should say a nice, respectable salam to people. All right, it's a Quran. It's a it's it's at it's a command and instruction within the Quran, etiquette from the Quran. So tahiyyah means greeting. At tahiyyat means the greetings. Now let's look at the next word. Lillahi. Lillah means for Allah. So if you put this together, the meaning that we got so far, literally speaking, is at tahiyyat lillah. The greetings are for Allah. Now there's a little bit of an issue and a problem here. What does that mean? Greetings are for Allah. We don't greet Allah, do we? Allah is a salam. We don't say assalamu alaikum to Allah. Allah is a salam. So what does it mean to greet Allah? Greetings are for Allah. So there's a little story behind this, behind the meaning of this that I want to share with you and it will help you understand what it means. A scholar by the name of Abdullah bin Salih al-Ijli, he tells his story. He says that I was interested in finding out what this means. Like really understanding the, the meaning, the significance, the beauty, the power of it. So he says, I went to a scholar by the name of Al-Kisai. Al-Kisai. Great scholar. And I asked him, what does At-Tahiyyatu Lillah mean? So he said, Mithl al-Barakat, it's like blessings. So I said, okay, if At-Tahiyyat is something like blessings, then what does Al-Barakat mean? What does blessings mean? So he goes, I, that's all I know. I can't tell you any more than this. So he says, okay, I obviously wasn't satisfied with the answer. So he says, I went to another great scholar of my time, Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, great scholar. So he says, I went to him and I asked him, what does at-tahiyyatu lillah mean? So he said, this is a word that we use to worship Allah. This is a word, huwa lafzun, that we worship Allah using, na'budullah bihi. We use it to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's all I can tell you. So he says, I obviously still wasn't fully satisfied. I wasn't content with the answer. So he says, finally I came across Muhammad ibn, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. I came across Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, great scholar. And one thing I'll tell you before I tell you the, what he said, 
The unique thing about Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, mashallah, these were all great scholars. But the unique thing about Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, is while being a scholar of the Arabic language, he was a poet. He was a poet. He was very skilled, very qualified in Arabic poetry. I mean, there's a collection of his poetry. And so it gave him a very unique perspective and a very unique skill and a, a, a skill set and a talent. So he says, I came to Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah and I said, what does the word at-tahiyyatu lillah mean? And then he sa says, I told him, look, I went to Al-Kisai and this is what he told me. I went to Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah and this is what he told me. So Imam al-Shafi'i al rahimahullah, he said, Laysa lahuma ilmun bi He says, why do you ask them? They don't know poetry. You have to ask a poet. You have to ask the right person. He says, let me explain something to you. He says, when you enter into the court of the king, how do you enter into the court of the king? You offer royal compliments. Even in English, we know this. When somebody enters the court of the king, what do they say? Your royal highness, your majesty, your greatness. Right? They say these words when entering the court of the king. In Arabic, in classical Arabic, they would say things like, Abayt um, al-la'na, you've removed curse from the lands. Aslim wan'am. All right, find, may you find peace, may you find blessings. They would say, uh, alfa sana, may you live for a thousand years. They would praise the king and in this manner they enter the court of the king. It's protocol, royal compliments. So he says that's what the word at-tahiyyat means. So when we say at-tahiyyatu lillah, we are saying royal compliments are exclusively for Allah. Royal compliments fit for a king are exclusively for Allah. At-tahiyyatu lillah. Now moving forward, was salawat, was salawat, and salawat. Salawat is the plural of the word salah, which means prayer. So our prayers are also for Allah. Wa tayyibat, tayyibat. This is the plural of the word tayyib. This means beautiful things, appealing things. So the beautiful and appealing things are also for Allah. And one thing that the scholars explain about this is that because it's being used in this manner in conjunction with the word salawat, salawat is like it's referring to the prayers, but it signifies all the ibadat, the worship that we have to offer is for Allah. And because the word tayyibat is being used in conjunction with it, the word tayyibat refers to the, uh, the beautiful character, the beautiful conduct, the way we conduct ourselves, our mannerisms, our dealing with people. So now look at the comprehensiveness of just the first four words of the tashahud. At-tahiyyatu lillah. Royal compliments are for Allah. Was-salawat. Prayers, worship, ibadah is for Allah. Wat-tayyibat. And the beautiful appealing things, our character, our mannerisms, our conduct is also dedicated and devoted to Allah. It's all done for the sake of Allah. And there's a very fine point in here. Because even when you conduct yourself appropriately, and you do it for the sake of Allah, that is not only sincerity, but that ensures that you will continue to conduct yourself in such a noble manner. Why? Because if you are, treat somebody good because of that person, because of what they did to you, because of that position of that person, what if tomorrow that person doesn't have that position? What if tomorrow that person does something that disappoints you? Then what are you going to do? You're going to start treating him uh, inappropriately and badly. What if that person treats you badly tomorrow? You'll treat him badly right back. Because your treatment of him was based on your view of him, your perception of him. So Allah, the, the Prophet ﷺ in this application teaches us, no. Even the way we conduct ourselves socially, publicly, is based on our commitment to Allah. We treat people good. Why? Because it pleases Allah. Because Allah has told us to. As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. This is the second portion within the tashahud. As-salam. Salam means peace and safety. Salam means peace and safety. It's a very, very, um, it's a very profound and a very comprehensive word. So many things come from this as a derivative. Islam, which means to submit to Allah, also comes from the root of as salam. So Islam means to submit. Why? Because by submitting to Allah, we achieve peace and safety. Not only that, I found something really interesting. You know, the Arabs were very fascinating in the way their language was constructed. They had a very, very interesting manner of naming things. So, sullam. Sullam in the Arabic language refers to like stairs or a ladder. Sullam. 
And that comes from the same root as the word salam, peace and safety. Why? Isn't stairs and ladders, aren't they kind of treacherous, a little bit, a little bit dangerous? You have to be careful when you climb a ladder. You shake it. You make sure it's stable. You ask somebody to hold the ladder for you. Right? When children, when we have small children in our house and we have stairs in our house, don't we put that little gate there so they can't access the stairs? Why? Because it's dangerous. So the Arabs said, look, okay, the stairs, these ladders, they're, they're dangerous things. So what should we name it? They named it safety. They call it safety. Sulam. So anytime anybody approaches stairs, the first thing that pops into his mind is what? Oh, be careful. Climbing the safety. So it's very fascinating how they would even give names to things. So as-salam means peace and safety. Alayka. May peace and safety. This is a form of supplication. This is a form of supplication. And the, the, the scholars even write that previously when people would supplicate for somebody, they'd make dua for somebody, they would say, Allahumma sallim ala fulan. Oh Allah, send peace and safety upon such and such person. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, even in our salam that we say to each other, As-salamu alayka or As-salamu alaykum. This is a more emphatic, this is the ismiya form. It's more emphatic, it's more powerful, it's more emotional of a tone. So As-salamu alayka, may peace and safety be upon you. Now who is the you referring to? The supplication tells us, Ayyuhan Nabi, O Prophet. So this is speaking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. The word nabi, let's, let's understand the word nabi thoroughly. It means prophet, that we normally translate it. This can come from either one of two roots. Either it comes from the root of the word naba. And the word naba in the Arabic language means news that is very, very important. And news that is relevant to you. News that is very, very important. And news that is relevant to you. So now think about that for a second. If Nabi comes from the root of the word, which means news that is important and relevant, then that means Nabi is the one who brings news that is important. And Nabi brings information or news that is relevant. Relevant. Now think about that for a second. Reflect on it. Think of what, see words they teach us lessons. When you understand what words mean properly. That means nothing the Prophet ﷺ said is unimportant. And nothing the Prophet ﷺ said or did is irrelevant. It's very profound. The second possible meaning or the second possible root of the word Nabi, the second possible meaning or the second possible root of the word Nabi within the Arabic language is that it comes from the root of the word Nabu'un. Nabu'un and Nabu'u. That basically means like an elevation, a protrusion. So when something is all at one level and then something is sticking out, jutting out, then that's called Nabu'un. It's an elevation. Why? Because the Nabi is an individual, he is a person who is at an elevated status. He's at a higher level, a higher status than the rest of humanity, than the rest of people. He's a messenger of Allah. So, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan Nabi. May peace and safety be upon you, O Prophet. Wa rahmatullah. Rahmah means mercy, and the mercy of Allah, meaning may the mercy of Allah also be upon you. Wa barakatuhu, wa barakatuhu, barakat. This is a plural of the word baraka, which means blessing. But the word baraka in its roots, it means blessings that are long lasting. Blessings that are long lasting. That's why the Arabs, they would call like a pond of water, a, a small collection of water that had been sitting around for a long time, they'd call it birka. Birka. If a camel sits down and is being stubborn and refuses to stand back up again, they say baraka al-ba'ir. The camel, just he's sitting now, he's not going to move. He's going to sit there for a while. So it, 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 it implies longevity. Longevity. So baraka means long-lasting blessings. Barakat is blessings, the plural. Who refers to Allah? And may His long-lasting blessings also be upon you. So, As-salamu alayka, may peace and safety be upon you, ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet, wa rahmatullah, may the mercy of Allah also be upon you, wa barakatuhu, and may Allah's long-lasting blessings also be upon you. Very thorough supplication. Very thorough. Now, one thing I want to clarify here before we go forward, 
is that we are speaking, are we speaking about the Prophet ﷺ or are we speaking to the Prophet ﷺ? When we say, Assalamu alaikum, it's to, second person. It's you. May peace and blessings be upon you. So what's the understanding of this? What's the implication of this? In reality, there is no implication of it. Why? Because the Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhum, all of these companions, they tell us in their narrations of which, in which they tell us the Prophet sallallahu taught them the tashahud, they say, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُعَلِّمُنَا التَّشَهُدْ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُنَا السُّورَةَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ The Prophet sallallahu would teach us the tashahud just like he would teach us a surah from the Qur'an. That means two things. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ emphasized the importance of the tashahud and the necessity of memorizing the tashahud. Just like we, surahs of the Qur'an are important and we have to memorize them, correct? Absolutely. So number one, that they are important and you need to memorize the tashahud. Just like you memorize a surah from the Qur'an. The second implication of this is verbatim, word for word. When we're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, Iyaka na'budu. Iyaka na'budu. Only you do we enslave ourselves to. Only you do we worship, do we enslave ourselves to. Who is it? We or I? We. It's plural, right? Na'budu is plural. Only you do we worship. It's plural. But what if I'm praying Salah by myself, on my own? If I'm performing salah individually, can I change it from we to I? Can I say, Iyaka a'abudu? Can I change it, anyone? Obviously not. Can't change it. Quran is Quran. You read it as it is. Exactly what the Prophet ﷺ was emphasizing about the tashahud. I've taught it to you like this. This is how you read it. So that's the answer to that question, in case anybody ever has that. The next portion of the tashahud. Assalamu alayna. Assalamu alayna. May peace and safety be upon us. Us. Wa rahmatullahi. Assalamu alayna wa ala. May peace and safety be upon us and upon ibadillah. Ibad means slaves. It's the plural of the word abd. Ibad. And there are two plurals for the word abd within the Quran ibad and abid. Ibad and Abid. The difference between them, Ibad can only be used when you are talking about the slaves of Allah. Ibad can exclusively be used, is exclusively only used when talking about the slaves of Allah. The word Abid is a general plural. It refers to the slaves of Allah, but generally speaking, if you're just talking about slaves, you can also use the word Abid. But Ibad is only for the slaves of Allah. Wa Ibadur Rahman, wa Ibadillah. So it only speaks about the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alayna, may peace and safety be upon us and upon the slaves of Allah, as salihin who are as salihin They embody, they have this quality of being salih, salah. The word salah means righteousness, to have your affairs in order. Salah means to have your affairs. It's the opposite of the word fasad. Fasad means chaos, corruption. Salah is the opposite of that. Salah means to have your affairs in order. Salih is one who has his affairs in order. Salih is righteous. Salihin is the plural of that. So what we're saying in this supplication, what the dua that we're making, Assalamu alayna, may peace and safety be upon us, wa ala ibadillahi salihin, and upon those slaves of Allah who are salihin, who have the quality of being righteous. Now what are some of the implications of what we just said? Number one, we're making dua for ourselves. But do we make dua in the singular form or in the plural form? Did we say, may peace and safety be upon me? Or did we, are we saying, may peace and safety be upon us? It's us, it's plural. Absolutely. That emphasizes unity. Unity of the Muslims. We need to be united. We never just think of ourselves. We think of the group, the unit, the ummah. The collective is very important. Should always be at the forefront of our minds. The collective. We are an ummah. So it emphasizes that unity. And subhanallah, when you look throughout the salah, surah al-fatiha, the tashahud, 
the plural is always emphasized. Because salah is the ultimate display of unity and salah is the ultimate means of cultivating, developing unity within the communities. Salah is the ultimate means to do so. Think about it. In salah, everybody stands right next to each other with no consideration of race, ethnicity, financial status, background, education level, spirituality, no difference. Even if you look at it religiously speaking, a hafiz of the Qur'an can be standing next to somebody who doesn't know two surahs of the Qur'an. Everybody stands right next to each other. And in sujood, everybody puts their forehead on the ground. Unity, the ultimate display of unity, and at the same time, the ultimate means of establishing unity. A community that prays together is one that is united. And a community, no matter how many other things they do, if they don't pray together, their jama'ah is not strong in terms of salah, they will always struggle in terms of their unity. And the, because the community of the Prophet ﷺ, which was the ultimate community, was very committed to praying salah together. So, assalamu alayna. We make dua for ourselves. Wa ala ibadillahi salihin. And then we make dua for others. Because in our dua, we should never be selfish. In our dua, we should never be selfish. Always make dua for other people as well. And subhanAllah, a really interesting incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. One time a Bedouin man came in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and have mercy on Muhammad and nobody else. Have mercy on me and have mercy on Muhammad and nobody else. The Prophet ﷺ said, you took something huge and you squeezed it into something very small. He said, the mercy of Allah encompasses everything. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ it's very vast. It encompasses everything. So he said, no, no, make dua for everybody. So we should never be selfish in our dua. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. But while we should never be selfish in our dua, we should also not be, we should also be sensible in our dua. We should be, we should not be selfish in our dua, but at the same time, we should be sensible. Practical in our dua. We make dua for ourselves here and for everybody else, but who are we making dua for first? Ourselves or everybody else? Ourselves first. That's sensibility. That's not selfishness. You are making dua for others, but first make dua for yourself. You know, as an example, I always tell people, you know when you get on an airplane, you're getting on a flight, and they make the security announcements, they give you the briefing, on what to do in case of an emergency, the emergency briefing. And they say that if the cabin loses air pressure, then the oxygen masks will fall. You know the announcement nobody ever listens to, nobody pays attention to, right? So they say if the cabin loses air pressure, then the oxygen mask will fall. And if you're with a child or an elderly person or somebody who's in need of assistance, what should you do first? First put your own mask on, then help somebody else. Why? Because if you don't put your mask on first and you're there helping somebody fiddling with their masks and because of lack of oxygen you pass out, now you're dead and they're dead too. You didn't help anybody. But you put your own mask on first, you secure yourself, then you're in a position to help somebody else. If somebody's drowning and you jump into the water to save them and you don't know how to swim, now there's two people drowning. Alright? So let the person who can swim get in the water instead of him having to jump in and drag two people out then. So it's sensible. That's why in the Qur'an, nothing is by accident in the Qur'an. What does Allah say in the Qur'an? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا Save yourselves and your families. Which one did He say first? Yourself or your family? Yourself. Because if you haven't saved yourself, how are you supposed to save your family? If you're not even worried about saving yourself, how could you ever be worried about saving your family? وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا Tell your family to pray, but you be very, very particular and regular about prayer. Because if you're not committed to your prayer, why would they ever be? So you have to secure yourself first. And that's what this supplication teaches us. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. Make dua for yourself and then for others. The next thing I want to point out here before we move forward is, did we make dua for others, ibadillah, or did we limit it to a certain type of ibadillah? Certain type. What is that type, everyone? Salihin. Salihin. Righteous people. What's the significance of that? 
Why are we limiting the dua? This is a motivational technique. This is a motivational technique. I'll explain. When I am making the dua, may the peace and safety of Allah be upon all the slaves of Allah who are righteous. Now think about this. Every single person, every single Muslim throughout the world performing salah, anytime they pray and they read their tashahud, are they making the same dua? Absolutely. So if I incorporate the quality of righteousness in myself, am I included in the supplications and the duas of every single person performing salah all over the world? I'm included in their dua. Not just now, but for generations and the generations that are to come. I will always be in the dua of the believers and the people performing salah. If I have the quality of salah. So it motivates you to have the quality of righteousness. So it's motivational. It makes you think, I need to be a salih. Alright? The last part of the tashahud is the core. Is the essence. It's the juice. It's the... Climax of the tashahud. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Ashhadu. This comes from the root of the word sh shahida. It means to witness something. So ashhadu means I bear witness, I give testimony. And a shahid, a witness, is called a witness because he was present at the scene of the crime or he presents himself for testimony in court. Another word that comes from this root that we all know about is the word shaheed, martyr. How does that come from this root? Well, the scholars, they explain that because he presented himself for the ultimate sacrifice. And some of the lexicons also state the fact that when this shaheed falls, angels are present around him. The angels present themselves. So either way, shaheed, martyr also comes from the same root. So ashhadu means I bear witness, I give testimony. An, that... La ilaha illallah. La. This la, what does la mean in Arabic? Everybody knows. La means no. But this is a special la. Special la. La li nafi al jins. This is a special la. This la means absolutely positively no. Absolutely positively no. Emphasis. No possibility. La ilaha. Ilah means one who is worthy of. One who is worthy of worship or veneration. So there is absolutely no one who is worthy of worship. Illa except for Allah. Illa is used to make an exception. La ilaha illallah. There is absolutely positively no one worthy of worship except for Allah. Wa ashhadu, And I bear witness. And I give testimony. Anna. Anna means that most definitely. Muhammadan. Muhammad is Abduhu, his slave. Who's the his referring to? Allah. His slave. Allah's slave. Wa Rasuluhu. And his messenger. Allah's messenger. So this is the last part of the tashahud. Let me explain a few points in here. The first thing is that Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ In the first part of it, you hear أَشْهَدُ أَن أَن In the second part about the Prophet ﷺ, you hear وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ Which one sounds stronger? أَن or أَنَّ أَنَّ sounds stronger. That's because in meaning it is stronger. It has emphasis. But the second question is, why emphasis here, but no emphasis in the first statement? Why? So if you think about it, you look closely, the la that comes after an in the first part of it, what type of la did I tell you it was? Special la. It means absolutely no. No way. Does it already have emphasis built into it? So is there need for further emphasis? No. But in the second part of the statement, is there emphasis coming from anywhere else? No. So that's why instead of an, the anna with emphasis is used. Subhanallah, you see the balance? You see the balance? The first one had emphasis through the la. So the second one got the emphasis through the anna. Next point to observe here. In one of the tashahuds actually is stated in this manner. If 
And, and so in another narration of the Tashahud, it also says, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan. What's missing in this one? Wa ashhadu, the second ashhadu. So if you look at this narration, isn't there a repetition of the word ashhadu? So you, somebody could argue it's unnecessary, it's extra. It's an unnecessary, it's extra. But it's there for a reason. It's there to give it equal importance. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu. It's there to give it equal importance. Why equal importance? If somebody came up here, stood up here, came up right now and said that, you know, I'm ready to become Muslim. And we started giving him the shahada. And he said that he's willing to accept the oneness of Allah, but he's not willing to accept the prophethood of Muhammad wasallam. Would his shahada be complete? No, he wouldn't. No, obviously, everybody knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes the same point. Giving equal importance to the statement about the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa being the Messenger of Allah. The next thing I want you to note here is look how it describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ عَبْدُهُ His slave. Calling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the slave of Allah is a very powerful statement. Because we just talked about Nabi means somebody who is at a higher station than the rest of people. But even he is the slave of Allah. Even he is the slave of Allah. And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he exemplified this quality. He exemplified this quality. The, the greatest day in the life of the Prophet ﷺ was the day of Fatih Makkah. The conquest of Makkah. The most glorious, victorious day in the life of the Prophet was Fatih Makkah. He's returning back to a city after 20 years. A people who had kicked him out of his own town, who had oppressed him and tortured him, who had killed his followers and companions. He's coming back, entering into the town victorious. Look throughout human history. Anyone else who's ever been in a similar position of victory over his long-standing enemies, look how and read how he must have entered into the city, entered into that area. At the head of the army, sitting on a big, beautiful white horse, Trumpets blaring, roses being thrown, hell, head held high, right? Victory, it's mine. But look at the Prophet ﷺ, how he enters in. The hadith tells us that the Prophet ﷺ was at the back of the army. He was at the back of the army. And his head was so, down so low that literally his beard was touching the back of the animal that he was riding. He had his head held so low, back of the army. And he was, recite, he was praying to Allah, praising Allah. La ilaha illallah wahda, sadaqa wa'da, wa nasara abda, wa azza jundahu wa hazam al ahzaba wahda. He was praising, glorifying Allah that Allah fulfilled his promise. He helped his slave. Didn't say messenger, didn't say prophet, he said slave. It's a proud station. In being the slave of Allah, we find our nobility, it's honor and distinction to be a slave of Allah. So saying the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad ﷺ is a slave of Allah, is very powerful and it's a lesson for all of us. We need to pride ourselves on being the slaves of Allah. وَرَسُولُهُ And his messenger. Now, Rasul, the word Rasul, it comes from the root of the word which means to send a message from a higher authority. To send in classical Arabic, Classical Arabic, it means to send, send a message from a higher authority. Rasul is one who carries a message, who brings a message from a higher authority. Is the one who we call Rasul. Now, the Prophet ﷺ has been described in the Tashahud with two distinct terms. Nabi and Rasul. What is the difference and what is the significance? Now, the difference between Nabi and Rasul, this is typically an Aqidah discussion. So I'm not going to get into it here because the point of this lecture and this class overall, even the Meaningful Prayer course, the point of it is to focus on the language of the Salah, the beauty of the language of the prayer. So I'm not going to get into the Aqidah aspect, but from a linguistic perspective, an interesting observation within the Qur'an is that whenever the word Nabi is used, because the word Nabi means to bring important news, relevant news, or to be at a higher level than the rest of people, wherever the word Nabi is used, it emphasizes the Prophet Wasallam's dealing and interaction with people. Like, like, Ya ayyuhun Nabiyu, lima tuharrimu ma halallahu lak. 
Ya ayyuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatik. When he's telling him, it's addressing him in terms of his relationship with his wives, and to tell his daughters, and to tell the believing women, it uses the word nabi. But when in the Qur'an, the, the point and what is being emphasized is the fact that he speaks on behalf of a higher authority. He has been sent by Allah. What he says is not from himself, but he's bringing it to you from Allah. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Tell them, O oh people, humanity, I have been sent, I am the messenger of Allah who has been sent to all of you. It's emphasizing, I've come from Allah, I bring. يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ بَلِّغْ مَا أُنْجِلَيْ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ when Allah tells the Messenger وسلم, to deliver, convey the message that has been revealed to you, the word Rasul is used to emphasize that relationship. And so this is a real brief discussion on the language of the Tashahud and some of the brief observations that we find within the Tashahud. Now, one last thing that I forgot to touch on is the name of the Prophet وسلم, himself, Muhammad. The name of the Prophet وسلم, Muhammad. Muhammad, it comes from the root of the word Hamd, which means to praise. Muhammad means one who is very frequently praised. Somebody who is praised very, very frequently, very often. Muhammad comes from Tahmeed, Taf'il, Mufa'al. Muhammad means somebody who is very frequently and very commonly praised. And the name of the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad, the given name of the Prophet ﷺ, it occurs within the Qur'an how many times? Four times. The word Muhammad, the name of the Prophet ﷺ, occurs in the Qur'an four times. First time in Surah Ali Imran, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ The second place is in Surah Al-Ahzab, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَاحِدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَخَاتِمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Third place is in Surah Muhammad itself, and the fourth place is in Surah Al-Fatih. Muhammadur Rasulullah. And one other given name of the Prophet ﷺ appears in the Qur'an once, and that is the name of Ahmad, which also comes from the same root as the word Hamd, which means the one who is praised, who is, who is praised uh, a, a lot more than others. So somebody who is praised frequently, and somebody who is praised in a very, very beautiful, in a very elaborate manner. So it emphasizes the praiseworthiness of the Prophet ﷺ. One interesting observation within the Qur'an though, wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the name of the Prophet sallallahu He's not speaking to him, he's speaking about him. He's not addressing him, he's talking about him. And in three out of those four places, the word Rasul occurs within the same ayah. Whenever Allah addresses the other messengers and the other prophets within the Qur'an, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Yahya, Ya Isa, Ya Musa, Ya Adam, but when Allah speaks to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He never calls him by his name. Ya ayyuhar rasul, ya ayyuhar nabi. He calls him with titles. He calls him with titles. And so the, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Himself teaches us the adab of speaking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within the Qur'an. Whenever we talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we shouldn't just say Muhammad said. No, no. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. The family members of the Prophet ﷺ, his own wives, his own children, he was a very casual, loving family member. But even they felt compelled to call him Messenger of Allah when they addressed him and spoke to him. Because they knew how Allah speaks to him. So we should be careful. The last thing I wanted to tell everyone about the name of the Prophet ﷺ is, has anyone ever read or ever heard the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was the first one to be given the name Muhammad? Anyone ever read that or heard that before? It's been published in some books. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he actually talks about this. And he says that this is something that was popularized by the Qusas, by the storytellers. The people who exaggerate when, they, when, they, when they're telling stories. But he says in reality, this is not true. And there's a record of at least, Ibn Kathir himself finds the record of at least seven individuals in Arabia, before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, who, were all, who also had the name Muhammad. He says this much is true though, is that the name Muhammad was a very rare name at that time. It was a name, but it was a rare name. It was not a very common name, not like today. So when today, when somebody tells you their name is Abdul Rahman, that's common. Somebody tells you their name is Abdul Baqi. So interesting. It's obviously people have that name, but maybe it's the first time you're, you're meeting somebody in person who has a name, Abdul Baqi. So it's, it was a more rare type of a name. Now, just to take a look at maybe one more tashahud, 
to highlight some of the differences and the beauty of the different variations of the tashahud, we'll take a look at the narration of the tashahud of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, one interesting thing in his narration is what I mentioned previously, that he says, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُعَلِّمُنَا السُّورَةِ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُنَا السُّورَةِ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ كَانَ يُعَلِّمُنَا التَّشَهُدْ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُنَا السُّورَةِ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ That the Messenger of Allah صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ would teach us a tashahud just like he would teach us a surah from the Qur'an. So he says that the shahud that he narrates from the Prophet ﷺ is At-tahiyyatu al-mubarakatu al-salawatu al-tayyibatu lillah Salamun alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Salamun alayna wa ala ibadillahi al-salihin Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Wa anna muhammadan rasulullah At-tahiyyatu the very first difference, we'll just highlight the differences. We've already done the full word analysis. The first difference in this tashahud is that at-tahiyyatul mubarakatu salawatu tayyibatu lillah. There's a new fourth word here in the beginning, and that is the word al-mubarakat. That is the word al-mubarakat. Mubarakat comes from the same root of the word baraka, it means blessed things. So this is saying that blessed things are also attributed to Allah. Meaning we thank Allah for them. We give the credit to Allah for all the blessings that we have within our lives. All the blessed things that we have. The next difference in this tashahud and the previous one was, the previous one was, At-tahiyyatu lillahi was-salawatu wa-tayyibatu. You hear the wow in there? What does wow mean in Arabic everybody? And. And. It's used to combine multiple items together. Here it's, At-tahiyyatu al-mubarakatu salawatu tayyibat There's no wow. What's the difference between having a wow and not having a wow from a rhetorical perspective? In eloquence, how does it make a difference? When you put a wow, so when I say toaster and oven, what does that imply? That they're two distinct separate items. There's a toaster and then the oven. But what happens when I say toaster oven? What is that now? That's one item, right? That's one item that serves both functions. Look at the difference. It still toasts and it still bakes. But what does it do? It does both of those separate functions within the same entity. And that's the difference. So when, when the, all these words are combined together, it's saying as if these, all of these components together comprise that one individual. Or our devotion, dedication to Allah is a combination of all these things. It still has its own distinct features of royal compliments, blessed things, and salawat, prayers, tayyibat, the beautiful things. It still has those individual components. But it is like one cohesive item, one entity that has multiple facets to it. The next difference is that the word lillah was in the middle of the first one. At-tahiyyatu lillah. Here it's at the end of it. التَّحِيَّاتُ الْمُبَارَكَاتُ الصَّلَوَاتُ الطَّيِّبَاتُ لِلَّهِ The position of the lillah has been changed. What does the changing of the position of the lillah change? If I say Khalid is my friend and Zayd and Amr. Khalid is my friend and Zayd and Amr. Didn't I just say Khalid, Zayd and Amr, all three are my friends? But which one did I give more importance to? Khalid. That's exactly how this works. So in the first one, it's like Khalid is my friend and Zayd and Amr. At-tahiyyatu lillah. Royal compliments are for Allah and prayers and beautiful things. This one, it's like if I were to say Khalid and Zayd and Amr, all of them are my friends. Did I just give them all equal importance? Yes. That's what this supplication does. At-tahiyyatu al-mubarakatu salawatu tayyibatu lillah. All of them combined. The next difference is this supplication says salamun. The first one said as-salamu. This one says salamun. The difference is as-salamu is proper. The peace and blessings. Which means the ultimate peace and blessings. Here it's salamun. Peace and blessings of all type, of all variations, from all angles, in all situations. It creates variety. When you make something common in classical Arabic, in Qur'an and prophetic supplications, it creates variety, versatility, diversity. So, as-salamu, the ultimate peace and blessings. Salamun, peace and blessings of every type, from all angles, 
in all situations. May it be upon you, O Messenger. And then the final last difference here, the tashahud, this one ends with, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah The ashhadu is missing. Didn't we just get done talking about why the ashhadu, the second one, was so important? Well, it's missing here. So I guess this is a lesser tashahud, right? Don't read this one, read the other one. No. This one is equally as powerful. What's the point it's conveying here? When we remove the ashhadu from the middle, do we bring Allah and Muhammad closer together? We say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasulullah. Didn't we just bring these two elements closer together like toaster oven? So the first one was emphasizing the equal importance in believing in Muhammad as a messenger of Allah. This emphasizes the fact that believing in Allah and believing in Muhammad as a messenger of Allah goes hand in hand. It's one cohesive thing. Both of them put together is called Iman. It's kind of like making the same point. But do you see how the same point is being made in two different ways? This is the beauty of the Arabic language. This is the point of this lecture. That's the point of the course. To see the profound beauty, the, just the baffling beauty, and the precision, the eloquence of the Qur'an and the prophetic supplication. So it makes the same point, emphasizing you need to believe in Muhammad as a messenger of Allah, but it does it in two different ways. And lastly, it says, وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ What's missing from the first one? Abduhu. Didn't we just spend like 10 minutes talking about why Abduhu was so important? And it was such a powerful statement? It's missing in this one. So lesser tashahud? Grade B? No. The, point, the benefit here, if you listen, the first one said, وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ this one says, وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The first one uses a pronoun. It says, His Messenger. This one says the name of Allah, Allah's Messenger. Which is more powerful when speaking about someone? You use referring to them as a pronoun or saying their name? Saying the name. Who did it? He did. Who, who gave that to you? He did. Or saying Khalid. Khalid gave it to me. Or he gave it to me. Khalid shows more respect saying his name, right? It's always more respectable, more impressive to speak with someone's name. And of course, what is the most powerful and the greatest and the most impressive name of all? The name of Allah. So even though this tashahud doesn't mention that Muhammad is the slave of Allah, so you think it loses some of its power and its beauty, instead of saying Rasuluhu, instead of saying his messenger, it says Rasulullah, Allah's messenger. It mentions the name of Allah, which in and of itself is very powerful. So this is just a brief little comparison of two of the tashahuds that we recite within the prayer. And now just obviously think, if you were to, if, you, if once you hear this and you understand what the tashahud means, the next time you sit in your prayer to recite the tashahud, will you be going, is, is that going to happen? No, now you're going to say, and you're going to think, Tahiyat means royal compliments. SubhanAllah. I'm offering my compliments to Allah. Entering the court of the king. Was salawat. The salah I'm praying now is for the sake of Allah. Tayyibat. All my beautiful conduct, my character, everything is for Allah. You'll think about it. It's a thought process. And that in and of itself is what we call khushur. That is the quality. That is the focus within prayer. So this is the point uh, of, of studying this, of learning this. And this is just a comparison of the first two, the tashahud of Ibn Mas'ud and the tashahud of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum. There are three more tashahuds that we teach within the course. And likewise, you get to see all the variations and all the beauty and all the power of the different tashahuds. And overall, the entire prayer is studied from beginning to end in the meaningful prayer course. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to internalize this material. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to understand this and and implemented in our salah and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all khushu and quality within our prayers and allow us to become closer to him by means of our prayers jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah